them. So, um, as Kate mentioned, we, we have uh, one of the GWEP grants. Here's my, my disclosures. Um, I also want to, to thank some new colleagues, relatively new colleagues uh, in Finland, uh, Kaisu Pakala and her team for introducing us to uh, an initiative that we've been developing that I will talk about later in the presentation. So my objectives in, in spending time with you today are really to look at the issues of loneliness and social isolation, talk about prevalence, look at the research that's done prior to COVID and the, the myriad research that's coming out now and, and um, op-ed pieces and editorials, uh, look at assessment issues and um, then share with you several intervention strategies and I'll talk most about the one that, that we are working on at, at St. Louis U or SLU as, as we refer to it. So um, let's start out by looking at the issues of of the two uh, phenomena, and as, as Sachin, who's the CEO of the Skin uh, Group Health Plan says, it's an epidemic in plain sight. And I thought those words were just so, so poignant. Um, it's, it's an important place to begin the conversation by uh, distinguishing between the two. Um, loneliness and social isolation, the terms get used synonymously uh, all the time, even in, in our academic literature, I notice, but they really are two distinct experiences. If you think about them from as kind of a researcher uh, perspective, one is qualitative, one is quantitative. So loneliness is the more qualitative. Um, it's, it's the lack of ec meeting expectations um, that one has for the relationships that they have in their lives. So for the meaningfulness of those relationships. And it's, it's very different for people. Uh, what, uh, you know, my expectation about a relationship may be, may be very different from yours. Social isolation, on the other hand, is the quantitative. It's the actual number of interactions, contacts, encounters that you have with other humans in a given period of time. Um, so you can be lonely and not socially isolated. You can be socially isolated and not lonely. Um, they do overlap, and as, as you'll hear me talk about here um, throughout the next few slides, the two are in fact linked, but it's important to make the distinction. Um, one of the interesting things that's that's happened is, you know, there were there were people studying this issue and talking about it um, prior to COVID, uh, but because uh, most of us um, around the world, in in many ways, have experienced this in in places um, where we've had to shelter at home, stay, you know, stay stay at home, work from home. And so now we there's a, an increased interest and awareness about these issues. So what do we know about loneliness? Um, it's the, the concept of it as a, as a social issue has been around, and people have been writing about it since the 60s. Um, Vivek Murthy, uh, who's a former, former US Surgeon General, uh, referred to it in 17 as a global um, health epidemic. And I don't know if you can all see this in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Um, I have a screenshot of the book that he just published. Uh, it's just really hot off the press where it's a book about uh, loneliness. Um, I, I haven't read it yet, but I've ordered it. So um, I think that, you know, it's it, it was being recognized well before COVID became part of our lives. Um, the National Academy of, of Science, Engineering and Medicine produced an, an outstanding, very comprehensive report this year, and they referred to loneliness as a public health concern. So it's been on the increase for a considerable amount of time, uh, and as I'll talk about, particularly among older adults. You can see here back in, in 06, um, people who were studying these issues began to see a decrease in the average network size of people. Cigna produced a, a wonderful report in 18 of all um, 20,000 uh, old adults in the U.S. across the age spectrum. Um, you can see these numbers. Um, they're, they're, they, I hope they're startling uh, because they should be. Uh, it's you know nearly half of, of people in our society, at least 20,000 anyway, uh, indicate that they sometimes or always feel lonely. Uh, over a quarter feel like people don't understand them. Um, those that live um, with others tend to feel less lonely, not surprising, but this last bullet point, please note this, the Gen Z uh, 
generation cohort, the 18 to 22 year olds currently, um, and heavy social media users reported to be the, the most lonely and the least healthy. So again, I hope those, those numbers um, are shocking. They certainly were to me when I first saw them. Prevalence is kind of all over the place. Um, there's, there's a number of different people who've come out with, um, you know, with prevalence studies. Uh, it, as you can see here, I just included several. Um, anything from 28% almost all the way up to about 60%. So it, I think it just sort of depends on who you ask, when you ask, and, and what age range, uh, particularly from, from older adults. Um, we do know uh, that uh, loneliness and social isolation tends to be um, extremely under assessed by healthcare and social service providers not something that's you know usually part of of the the intake or the the patient assessment process uh, risk factors uh, not surprising i i would guess uh, people who tend to be isolated do experience uh, greater loneliness those with very small or no networks um, those that engage in in few social activities those who live alone you'll see that as a recurring theme those that are unmarried unpartnered and those um, who are, are low income and that really relates more to a an access issue to being able to 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 be more social social isolation on the other hand um, has uh, been linked um, multiple times and quite recently new study just came out this week i'll mention it later that um, also confirms this um, there is definitely an increased risk for dementia um, because of the lack of, of stimulation and uh, we know that those older adults who are socially isolated and again this is pre-covid um, i heard one estimate that um, this has increased threefold um, during during these last five to six months so uh, we know that socially isolated older adults do tend to experience stress. They um, often underutilize, um, possibly because of access, social resources, and they have uh, disturbed sleep. Again, similar kind of risk factors, being unmarried or unpartnered. Males tend to be more socially isolated than females, uh, low education, low income again. Um, take note of this, this final bullet point. Uh, Medicare estimates um, in 2018, and again, be interesting to see what those numbers look like now, uh, an estimated 6.5 billion a year uh, is spent due to increased hospital stays because people don't have the support they need um, in their homes, in the community, so they're, they're coming in and seeking health care in that regard. What are the predictors? Um, there's a, a lengthy list, and I think that um, probably none of them are, are going to be surprising to you. The strongest predictors on this list are the, the ones that are highlighted uh, at the bottom. Um, depression or other mood um, disorders, living alone again, um, being poorly understood by others, and then members of the LGBTQ plus community uh, oftentimes experience greater loneliness um, than their counterparts. So I think that we, we need to be mindful of these things uh, and again incorporate, you'll hear me say over and over in the next few minutes, but, you know, ask the questions, ask the questions and, and look to see because as you'll see there's a significant impact on physical and mental health. Speaking of which, um, the, the, the research that's uh, been done prior to the pandemic and some of the research coming out um, during this, this period uh, is very clear that there are fairly devastating uh, effects of loneliness and social isolation. When you have both together, um, it it's sort of um, exacerbates the, the potential impact. So the impacts are in the areas of physical health, mental health, and then certainly healthcare utilization. Um, and this is not by any means um, an, an exhaustive list of the impacts that have um, been shown through evidence to, to exp be experienced by older adults specifically. So um, I'll start over on the, the left-hand side, impairment of physical health, increased blood pressure, depression, weight gain, smoking, substance abuse, alone time. Um, there's even been um, reason to, to think that it, it can impact um, 
certainly the dementia pieces I talked about, which is in the next um, column, but, but also that it can lead to um, institutionalization that may not needed to have happened otherwise. I just ran across a, a quote from Steve Cole at UCLA this week that I um, just, just added to the, to the uh, slides because I thought it was um, just so, um, it so captured um, the issues. Now, loneliness acts as a fertilizer for other diseases. The biology of loneliness can accelerate the buildup of plaque in the arteries, help cancer cells grow, spread and promote inflammation in the brain. Loneliness promotes several different kinds of wear and tear in the body. And um, I, I think most of us, um, me included, before I started to work in this area, just this was not on anybody's radar really to think about this um, in any kind of meaningful way. So from a, a mental health perspective, certainly uh, the impact on stress and depression, uh, anxiety as well. I've already mentioned the issue of cognition. Um, a new study just came out, um, well, two studies, the Sundstrom et al. and then the Sutton et, et al. And Sutton just came out within the last week or so. Um, it, find that it's um, certainly a, a risk factor for dementia, although Sundstrom and the group uh, found it was for, for Alzheimer's disease, but not necessarily vascular dementia. And then healthcare, 50% uh, increase in emergency services, more than 12 primary care visits per year. And then as I alluded to earlier, the, the issue of institutionalization um, that ha happens either prematurely or at all. This graphic from HRSA, um, I think, just does a nice job of summarizing um, the, the um, kind of overall picture that we're dealing with. Uh, again, 43 in this case, close to 50% feel lonely on a regular basis, 45% uh, increase for risk of mortality. Uh, and this last one, um, this is the one that seems to resonate most with people to understand the significance of this issue, because we all know the dangers of obesity, and we all know the dangers of, of smoking. And if you equate the impact of loneliness to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, I think that elevates it to a place that, that everyone can understand um, the potential impact. So Holt Lundstad, who um, is um, a major uh, figure in the world of, of studying loneliness and social isolation, um, asked this really important question. Is it loneliness specifically, or is it people becoming more socially disconnected? And she and her team um, published in, in 15 um, this really landmark study looking at, again, this increased risk for uh, this case, death. 32% experienced uh, increased risk for death who lived alone, 29% for those socially isolated, and 26% of those who you know, reported feeling lonely. And she provides, a, she and her team provide a, a graphic here that kind of walks us through um, how this impacts us. So, you know, it inflames the brain's white blood cells, as, as, as Cole mentioned, uh, that leads people to feeling irritable, all these negative feelings, the brain misreads these social signals, others become threats to us, and our reality then becomes distorted. We tend to, to withdraw from those in our networks in some cases. So let's talk about assessment. Um, it's an important piece, and there's lots of different ways to assess, and most of which don't have to be uh, a cumbersome process or take time in an already busy clinical. So, you know, as, as with everything, there's, there's a sense multiple ways to, to get at the information. Certainly there's a, there's a variety of validated multi-item scales that, that don't ask about it matter from the, the issue of, of looking at depression, anxiety, or social support, uh, which can get you to the issue of loneliness, but doesn't ask necessarily. The other option is just simply to ask people if they're lonely. And if you notice that this sort of footnote at the bottom, um, Nicolaisen and Thorson noted that women uh, are more likely to respond when asked directly, where men will be more likely to sort of declare this if they're asked uh, questions in a, in a scale or a questionnaire. So something to remember. Um, 
These are the areas I think that you can look at standardized measures, mood, social support, loneliness, physical health, certainly showing the impact. And again, this both you know, qualitative and um, quantitative ways to look at that. Ask people what they think about lonely. And, and I think we have to be really careful in our assessments not to be making assumptions about, um, you know, just because someone lives alone and their, you know, their children, their, their spouse, partner has, has died um, and their children don't live anywhere near them. Um, you know, we, we can't make an assumption that they're lonely. So we need to ask. Here's some sample open-ended kind of questions uh, that, that you can incorporate into your clinical work. Um, read the list here. And I think you have to think about, you know, what fits in, what, what are you most comfortable, what do you have time um, to ask about. And also remember with any kind of an assessment, there's a lot of stigma attached um, and uh, people don't want to be viewed sort of in this stereotypical way that society has historically viewed older adults as being these people who, um, you know, are isolated and, and, and don't interact with the rest of the world. Um, and so I think that we have to be, be mindful of that and, if you know, your patients. So, you know, work, work this in in a way that you think is going to be most conducive to them sharing. If you want to do the uh, sort of gold standard of assessments, um, and these are just simply recommendations, these are some of the measures that we use um, in the work that we're doing at, at St. Louis U, but certainly you want to look at cognition. Um, we use the rapid cognitive screen, which is the shortened version of the St. Louis University mental status exam. Uh, we use the PH2Q2 uh, and then 9 uh, to look at depression um, and generally generalized anxiety scale for anxiety. Social support, uh, my social work colleague, uh, Jim Lubbin at Boston College developed the Lubbin social network years ago, and there is a shortened version of that. Um, in terms of loneliness, there are several scales out there. Um, the one that, uh, the valid of uh, the validated scales that are out there, the UCLA loneliness scale, which there's also a shortened version of. Uh, we have actually developed um, a scale, which we're in the process of uh, validating and it's called the alone scale. Um, and I, I'm happy to, I, have, I think I have a, a copy of it here. I'm gonna go over these. And then certainly mobility. Um, and uh, SARC-F uh, looks for sarcopenia, obviously, uh, is a scale that was also developed at St. Louis University and is, um, is validated as well. Oh, did not include that. In the interest of time, I didn't have pictures. I'm happy to send these slides and I have uh, information on each of the scales. So let me let me shift gears here and and talk about interventions. Um, there are a number of things out there, and there's lots and lots. I can't emphasize lots of interest right now in uh, de developing interventions. I I get emails, calls uh, every week uh, for the last five months uh, to to talk about what can we do about this issue. So, um, and I'm relatively new to this whole area, so I, I can only imagine what those who've been at this work for many years are getting. The most important issue I think to remember about um, intervening in this is that one size does not fit all, as, as the quote says here. Uh, loneliness and social isolation are, are very individual, individually, defined kind of experiences for people. So it's, it's critical that we are, are thinking very patient-centered uh, kinds of approaches when we're thinking about this. And as I'll talk about, there's some, there's some people who think that, that you should have a different intervention if someone's lonely versus uh, socially isolated. Um, so Sandra Edmonds crew commented in a webinar this year that I, I was participating in. Uh, social isolation is a micro level consequence of macro level social forces. Uh, and I think that's an interesting comment. Um, and the reason I, I, I think that's such an interesting comment is that um, Dr. Sachin, who uh, he's the one who said it's an epidemic in plain sight. He, um, actually on the same webinar, um, he actually shared something that I was not aware of, and that is that at the beginning of the last century, the U.S. was viewed as uh, one of the most age-segregated 
countries in the world. Uh, today, in 2020, we are at the bottom of the list. Um, and if you think about sort of this movement over the past some years, decades, um, you know, we have begun to segregate older adults. We have retirement communities. We certainly have, you know, residential facilities. Uh, we have, um, you know, even, even um, you know, activities are, are segregated by age. Um, and then sort of the, the more informal families have moved away. Uh, my children, for instance, did not grow up within 500 miles of grandparents. And so we, they've had very little opportunity actually um, as they were growing up to interact with grandparents. They, they've chosen and been able to change that as adults, but um, we just weren't ever able to live close. And I think that's, you know, with the mobility we're experiencing in society, that's becoming more and more the case. So um, this graphic kind of tries to organize how we might um, think about approaching this. So we have to engage in the issue. We have to engage people who can make a difference in it. We have to, to determine what are going to be the most impactful kind of approaches and interventions that we can do. But most importantly, you know, we have to figure out how to sustain those. Um, my fear is that once this pandemic has passed, and I keep having to believe it, it's going to, just don't know when, obviously, um, that, that, you know, this, this, re, this interest, not renewed, it's this new interest that we have across um, society is going to go away as we kind of all move back into to our former normal lives. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, that the interest um, and the education that's happening now um, will at least sustain, you know, some, some part of that. Let me just sort of move this so I don't know if the others are not able to see this. So looking at how, how do we get to people? So it, this, we have to approach this at multiple levels. It's a community issue. It's a family issue. It's an individual older adult kind of issue. So we need to understand um, we need to, to know the extent of it in our communities. We need to know uh, in this particular time that we're in right now, uh, with the, the increased, significantly increased use of technology to stay connected, we have to know what the capability of older adults are. One of our local uh, GWEP partners here surveyed, um, they have several hundred older adults who receive home delivered meals. 75% do not have access to internet. So, you know, offering anything via uh, telehealth for them is, is not an option. So um, then looking at the approaches, we need to be thinking about how to reach people. Uh, again, keeping in mind that there is a lot of stigma attached to someone being able to say, I'm lonely or, you know, I haven't talked to my children in weeks, months, whatever. So um, looking at how do, we, how do we get word out um, about options and initiatives and interventions. I think, again, it has, as you'll see uh, from an example I have from the UK, uh, they, they have taken it national, and I think in a very, very creative way. So as, as health and social service providers, you know, what can we do? Um, and, and these comments, as you can see at the bottom here, come from the British Geriatric Society and the Royal College of, of Psychiatrists. And um, the, the UK has taken this issue very seriously. They have, in fact, uh, appointed a minister of loneliness. Um, and I'll talk some more about some of their initiatives, I think, on the next slide or two. So we need to make sure that we're adequately um, getting treatment for older adults who are experiencing any kinds of issues that will limit their ability to be independent and mobile. And this is a, you know, a sampling of, of those kind of things that, that people experience that can cause them to sort of um, self-isolate or withdraw from their usual communities or not find the, um, the interactions that they're having to be meaningful. So chronic pain, sensory impairments, you know, think about the person who's, who's got the hearing impairment and they don't have a hearing aid, they won't wear their hearing aid, um, and, you know, they, they struggle in, in public and social kind of situations to, to hear and engage. 
So incontinence, foot health, malnutrition, oral health. I don't know that most of us would, would initially connect those things to, to people being lonely and socially isolating themselves, but I, I think we have to. So certainly identifying um, any issues with mood uh, as well as cognition. Um, ideally, in, in, in this you know, panacea world uh, that we don't live in, um, we would have um, a comprehensive geriatric assessment for, for every older adult. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here about the importance of that. Um, and I'm sure you know that you know, for those, there's an increase of 25% likelihood that older adults can still live at home after six months if they've had this thorough uh, comprehensive ass uh, assessment with appropriate follow-up, of course. Uh, regularly monitoring patients' needs um, and asking um, just, it may take you several times of, of addressing this issue before someone you know, is, is comfortable enough to be forthcoming with, with an accurate picture of what their lives are like. Um, be, being very mindful, uh, and again, don't need to tell this group that, about incorporating um, the caregiver into this process if there is a caregiver. I'm, I'm not talking a whole lot today about caregivers, but um, I, I think, and it's probably not a surprise, that caregivers, uh, particularly those caring for uh, someone who has dementia, can be extremely lonely and, and socially isolated. And there's some research out there that, that provides evidence for that very thing, especially right now. We are offering um, cognitive stimulation therapy and a loneliness social isolation group, as well as caregiver groups virtually through our SLU memory clinic. My colleague, Dr. Max Zabatsky, uh, oversees that. And the caregivers are, are struggling um, mightily to, to stay, to get connected, stay connected, uh, even with family members. And um, so we need to make sure we're, we're asking how the caregiver is doing as well. Uh, and then engage in social prescribing, um, which means just no resources or know that one resource that you can send them to that will get people connected. Uh, Tim Carpenter from, from Engage said, it's bigger than the physician. So um, I, I think that's an important point to make. We, we don't need to risk solely on physicians to address this issue. Um, to use a way overused cliche, it really does take a village. Um, so approaches. Um, there, there were interventions that began to, to emerge and be written about back in the 80s. Um, and they, as I said, show some promising uh, results, but the dropout rates were very high. So the, the group in Finland that I mentioned um, began almost 20 years ago to study this issue. And they've, um, they've concluded that um, the ideal intervention or the effective intervention includes physical activity, exercise, cognitive stimulation, and facilitators who understand group dynamics and um, understand older adults. So this is actually a, a, a group um, here in St. Louis. Um, the, the so I want to, to quickly talk about uh, four different potential interventions. The first three don't really have um, evidence to suggest, um, but I think they're interesting. I think they're ones that are would be you know, that we need to know about. Um, I love this first one, the friendship benches. This, um, the, the research on this comes out of Africa, actually, and um, it's just what it says. Uh, benches were placed outside of primary care clinics uh, and staffed with lay trained health workers, referred to as grandmother health providers. Uh, and then they studied what happens over, over time. And uh, they, they would have up to six 30 to 45 minute sessions with people. Um, and they got amazing results. Um, they, depression scores went down. People felt uh, they had more access. Um, they felt like they had a, a support structure. It was an immediate um, intervention for people who wouldn't be able to access it otherwise. And it didn't cost much. So um, I think this is, is something that we could certainly do in this country. I, I'm not aware of any that are happening. Uh, there's some, some kind of anecdotal things about the couch that appears in, in urban areas sometimes where people can just sit down and talk. Um, and that actually is much, much like what the UK did. I mentioned that um, the UK uh, appointed a ministry of loneliness and to, has its own minister uh, in 17. And um, in uh, 19, the police departments uh, in England began to 
uh, put chat benches around the cities. And um, they're just that. They're, they're, there's, no, there's no person there to interact with. It's just people are encouraged to sit down, take some time out of their day, and talk. So um, I haven't seen any results or anything. It's so new, uh, but I'm, I'm very eager to hear, you know, what, what the outcomes of those things um, begin. Befriending services have actually been around for forever. Um, my very first uh, experience um, in any kind of pseudo professional way uh, was as an undergraduate social work student. In my introduction to social work course, I had to do service learning, which is very typical. Um, and I uh, knew I did not want to work with children, lovely as they are. Uh, I did not want to work with children. So I worked out an arrangement with the local uh, retired senior volunteer program that I could be adopted by an older adult who, who was um, lonely and or socially isolated. Didn't refer to it in that way all those years ago, but um, I, I visited her um, at least once a week for my semester and I continued on after that. That's a befriending service. It's a relationship between two or more individuals um, that's initiated, supported, and, and monitored. Um, and both parties are, are supposed to in benefit from, from being able to develop this relationship. This has been used in universities for a long time as a way to provide experiential learning for students, but I've noticed just in the last few months, um, it's exploding. Uh, we, I, I, I'm on several social work listservs and people are talking about this happening at, at their universities. My, I, I convinced my colleague who teaches intro to social work to um, develop, uh, to work with some local organizations to be able to do a phone check-in kind of program, um, since in-person visits is, is not really an option for either the students or or the, um, the older adults. And um, these programs have been studied. Um, and they do uh, show decreases in loneliness and social isolation. Uh, but I, I think that the, the other important piece is while it certainly benefits the older adult, um, it definitely uh, benefits the, the volunteer, particularly I think if the volunteer is, is a younger adult. Technology, um, obviously we all use technology, um, but, uh, and there are some incredible um, kinds of technology, devices, uh, software that's out there that can begin to address the issues around loneliness and socialization. I attended actually a webinar that was entirely devoted to using technology to, with older adults to reduce loneliness and social isolation. And the, the, the bells and whistles and the toys uh, were just amazing, but I think we have to be mindful um, whether it's a voice activated, uh, a virtual care assistant, interactive photo sharing, um, uh, websites that will match people, all, you know, these are just a sampling of, of things I've listed here. Those are all wonderful, but we have to be um, very cognizant of what capability does the older adult have. That's one of the struggles we've had when we moved our in-person groups at the university to, to virtual. Uh, for instance, our first, first group, um, of circle friends, which I'll talk about, um, was was spent uh, pretty much entirely working on technology issues, um, and so didn't even really get to the issues until the to the second session. I was on a, a webinar um, also in which one person said, "Please, please don't forget the phone is a wonderful way to communicate with people." So I think we have to just keep in mind co living arrangements. Um, are beginning to, to spring up around this. This photo actually is, is from the, the newspaper uh, here in St. Louis. There's a small but growing program uh, that matches older adults and persons with disabilities um, to live with uh, younger adults. And there's um, not a lot of evidence yet. I think that I'm not seen any that shows that um, you know what what the outcomes are but I think just you know anecdotally what we know is it's it's a benefit for both um, and universities have begun around the country to promote these kind of arrangements um, it benefits the student they have uh, reduced 
cost or in some cases free uh, housing. Uh, the older adult has, has help and support and companionship. So, and people um, want to live in their own homes. We, we very much have moved toward um, aging in place. So I think these, these arrangements will continue to increase as communities are seeing their benefits. Oh, housing uh, also takes on a bit of a different approach. Um, I have two colleagues, two social work colleagues who uh, just published a book in 19 on, on co-housing. They visited 14 different uh, co-housing programs throughout the country and kind of wrote about them and then uh, talked about the, the, the pros and cons of, of co-housing. So these co-housing arrangements are when typically, um, and the ones they studied mostly were where were older adults come together. Uh, obviously, I talked about the intergenerational piece uh, on the last slide, but these um, these the co-housing that, that my colleagues studied looked at uh, when when older adults come together. Uh, the village program, if you're familiar with that, is is one very um, it's not informal, but but it's one version of that. The the co-housing arrangements go from the very loosely defined to highly structured, you buy into it, there's a governance board, and then there's sort of everything in between. Um, it's, it's, it's great for those people who seek a more intentional kind of community, who want that kind of interaction, those kind of relationships. Uh, there are some barriers and it, it is definitely not for everyone. Um, for those that are more structured, that have a, a governance um, process is part of it. Uh, it's a time commitment, can be very expensive to buy in. Um, people may just not want that level. They're also somewhat segregating, um, to get back to my earlier point about the age segregation. So you know, it's an option. Um, and I think that, you know, people need to know about it um, is sort of where, where I left um, my, my reading on that. So Circle of Friends is the, is the initiative that we've developed at St. Louis University that I want to spend the, the last few minutes here talking about. And um, it is, uh, as I mentioned, a, a group intervention that was developed uh, by academics uh, in Finland. And uh, about 20 years ago, uh, almost, uh, they, they began to, to recognize the issues and wanted to uh, be able to address it. So they studied, they looked at the prevalence uh, in Finland uh, and, and ended up developing a group intervention based on a group excuse me, rehabilitation model, uh, bringing older adults. It is not intended for those with um, cognitive impairment, but certainly someone in the early stages or who has MCI could, could easily and, and actively engage. Um, its sole purpose is to alleviate and or prevent loneliness and social isolation. The group protocol is to meet 12 times over three months. It's a small group. Um, and you can see here, the goals are to make new friends, feel less lonely, share feelings of loneliness, um, do meaningful things together, and help the group to, to, to bond and become supportive of one another. Um, I think the, the unique features of this, what we all know about groups, um, support groups in particular, but I think there's some really unique features uh, that the circle of friends includes that make it um, different than the, than the typical kind of social group or, so, or social support group that an older adult could, could become part of. And that is that the intent is that the facilitator starts the group, so that first segment of 12 sessions is run by a facilitator. The facilitator's job is to work themselves out of a job. So at the end of that period, they um, hopefully are able to transition out of a leadership role, uh, leave the group, maybe be available for support, kind of leave the group, and the group continues on on its own. Um, and you can see, and I'll talk about the success that they've had in Finland with that. The other um, thing that makes it unique is that the topics that are brought into the group sessions um, are determined by the group members themselves. And in the facilitator uh, 
period when there's a facilitator involved, they may make sure, they may make the arrangements, they might gather the resources to, to address the topics, but it's really topics that are important to the members themselves. So uh, the, the group in Finland has been prolific in their publications. I just uh, included a couple of their studies here. Uh, they, uh, their first one was a, a randomized controlled trial of 235 older adults. And uh, at two years after the initial intervention, 7% were still um, living uh, as compared to the 90% in the control group. Uh, they had a very impressive uh, dropout rate of only 2.5%. Six of the 15 groups continued meeting um, and they overall experienced improved cognition and obviously decreased loneliness. So the second study I'm, I'm highlighting here is 117 and 95% at the, at the end of the group reported they no longer felt lonely. Big range, 45 to 85, so they made new friends. And then 40% also continued meeting. So I think that, you know, that's, that's good evidence um, that this, this is um, a meaningful and effective kind of an experience. So why does it work? Um, it's, uh, it's positive, it's very uh, group focused, it's very process focused. Um, you know, it, it impacts both the, the emotional well-being as well as the physical well-being um, that I talked already about the member involvement in planning and uh, the, the way in which it's, it enables people to become engaged. Um, here in, in St. Louis, uh, we have developed an Americanized version of the and uh, our, we have two community partners who were able to get funding through our local senior tax. And they started groups uh, over a year ago, just, well, just about a year ago, actually. And they were doing wonderfully. They had gotten through their first round of, of 12 weeks. They had embarked on the second and COVID hit. So um, we now have some additional new funding that are going to enable those two organizations to be able to now move everything online. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. This is actually a photo of one of the groups in our uh, local public housing authority. And uh, they were running five groups out of uh, what they call senior buildings. And I, uh, I had the very good fortune to be able to meet monthly with their facilitators, uh, who were actually also residents of, the, of those buildings in which they facilitated the groups. And it was I have to say, probably one of the most impactful experiences I've had. I was also invited to attend um, their uh, celebration at the end of the first round. There were 47 older adults from public housing who participated. I think 41 were at this dinner on the worst possible weather night in, in December. And um, the, the funder was actually there as well. And she and I sat together and, and um, I have to say, we, we teared up listening to the stories uh, of how much this, this group had, had impacted the older um, residents of, of those buildings. So um, these are also all pictures. Our other partner in the community works exclusively with older adults with intellectual and developmental disability. And uh, they too were running five groups and were doing wonderfully and then COVID hit. So uh, we're, we're pairing up with our new funding to start new groups within the next month. Um, so each session, just real quickly here to talk about it, has three components. There needs to be some kind of creative activity. It can be um, in some kind of art activity, going on a field trip. Uh, it can also be bringing a, you know, a speaker or a, a performer in. Uh, there needs to be a health exercise component. Could be again a speaker. Uh, it could be in having people engage in some kind of physical activity. And then the third component is reflection. And uh, the protocol developed in Finland calls for people to write about their feelings and then discuss. Um, but our groups here have have approached that differently. For instance, the, the public housing authority group uh, they chose to make books of their lives and um, share those with one another. So they, they did that over the course of, of the 12 sessions. So what has COVID, I think, taught us about the issues of, of loneliness and social isolation? Um, I think it goes without saying that, that relationships 
Um, we, we recognize the importance of those, the importance of staying connected. I obviously don't need to, to tell this group that. Um, but we also, you know, need know that we, we need to probably do a better job planning. We need to do a much better job paying attention. Oops, sorry. Um, paying attention to people's needs and feelings. And um, that it's important that we all engage in meaningful and, and stimulating activities. Two studies that just came out, um, I don't know if you can see this over here, but um, this study came out of Spain looking at decreased contact. Um, and this was actually data was collected after COVID uh, hit in, in Spain and uh, decreased contact, increased loneliness, not a surprise. Um, and then the second study looked at um, how stay at home in places where there was a stay at home order, uh, again, not surprising, loneliness was in. So physical health, we've all been pushing and promoting eating healthy exercise. But again, you know, these are challenges in many cases for older adults. Um, technology, I've already sort of addressed this issue. Um, the one thing that I've, I've um, heard over and over again that I've shared with others is, you know, that, that one of the things that, that we can encourage everyone to do, especially during the really acute phase of, of the, the pandemic, was to, to kind of go on a news diet um, and limit that because it can increase one's stress, increase that fear and anxiety. So, what have we learned um, as providers? Well, we've sadly learned that ageism and health disparities um, are still uh, rampant, really, throughout our society. Uh, we've learned that older adults are very fearful, and I'm sure you've heard this in your, in your practices uh, about moving forward after and going back. I have a, an older family member who said, I don't ever see myself eating in a restaurant again but um, and she's a retired nurse. So I, I hope that, that that is not um, the case for her. Um, we need to make sure we're reaching out to people on a regular basis, asking the questions. As the um, box at the top says, just ask people, what, what do they feel? What do they want? What do they need? And what are they ready for? Um, and we've got, there are other ways to communicate um, that we might not always think about. Uh, we've talked about the issue and we always obviously I don't need to tell this group we need to take care of ourselves and we need to remind caregivers uh, as well. So how do we address this on the community level? Education, education, education. Obviously we're doing that here today. Uh, we need to address um, this as an interprofessional kind of approach. We need to address the structural factors um, and we need more research. We need evidence for good interventions and what works. Then at the individual level, we need to make sure that the interventions, whatever those might be, um, are, are individualized, non-stigmatizing, and, and meaningful. Some people believe that um, an intervention for loneliness should be a one-on-one, -on -one, kind of a cognitive behavioral therapy approach, and social isolation should be a uh, group intervention. I don't know. I think, I think we need more study on on that one. Um, we need to, you know, emphasize for people that, you know, getting engaged can can certainly impact their physical and mental health. Um, so, last slide here because I wanted to allow some time for for questions. Um, we really have to approach this sort of ecologically, um, all the way from policymakers all the way down to ensuring that the the older adult feels safe. Um, and they're feeling listened to and that their voices are being heard around this issue. And then kind of, as you can see here from the, the graphic, everything in between. So lots of resources um, that are out there. I reached out to um, my colleagues um, at your university that I know um, who, who are in the School of Social Work and I asked uh, for them. And I also asked Kate uh, some, about some resources and um, Age Friendly Seattle uh, was one that, that came up uh, from a couple of different people. The Pearls program at uh, Catholic Community Services uh, was a program that's a great program. Please, please check it out if you're not familiar. You may be familiar with all these things. Certainly your own university's Memory and Brain uh, Wellness Center offers a lot of ways for people to engage, particularly now. Uh, and then just recently, just this week, uh, I was actually 
like talking to someone who's writing a book on loneliness and social isolation. And she um, had visited Providence Mount um, St. Vincent with, and she was describing it to me. So I, I wanted to put it on here as a, a great example of a way to address this age segregation issue with the, with the child care center that's located within the, the residential community. So I'm going to fly through these because um, you can certainly look at these. Uh, AARP SAGE uh, has some really great uh, resources for this very issue that were actually there before um, before COVID, but are, are getting a lot more traffic now. Uh, Circle of Friends, uh, the, the group in Finland has a website. Uh, the website will translate automatically to English, but a lot of, of what they have on the website will not. So um, they do have some videos which are, are uh, subtitled, at least you can, can watch those. Um, our Geriatric Education Center, um, National Academy, their, their report that just came out, more, more resources. Here's reading um, for you to do if you really want to, to dig more into it. These are all the articles, or some of the articles, but this is all um, from the Finland group. And there's more on training. And uh, our website is aging.slu.edu. We just uh, this week uh, uploaded a uh, two hour asynchronous uh, webinar uh, that trains people in how to implement a Circle of Friends group. Um, we were just waiting on marketing's approval to, to let it go live, but I think we were supposed to do that yesterday or today. And um, please visit it, or if you have someone who's interested, please send them to, to our website for that. Um, my email is here at the